Hey bosses, this week's sponsor is Masterworks.io, the pioneer in blue chip art investing for everyone. We'll tell you more about them during the break. Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hola, amigos, and welcome to episode 131 of the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Johnny FD. I'm actually here in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. Sam, welcome to the show. You are in Charlotte. I'm in Charlotte, and man, I can't wait to hear about your adventures in the Yucatan Peninsula coming up on our quarterly updates. But what's your take so far? How do you like it? I love it. I really love it. I, I love Mexican food. I like the people. I like the culture. I like the weather. I like the beaches. I love Mexican beer. It's it's cheap. It's nice. It's easy. I, I really like it here. And we're in the same time zone pretty much for, for once in our life. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're keeping up, keeping these podcasts going. And this week, we have a, another excellent guest on in Howard Marks. Johnny, you excited for this? I am very, very excited. So, so Howard Marks has had a crazy cool background. He was an entrepreneur and actually the CEO of a huge company called Activision. He, he co-founded that. And if you guys play Call of Duty, you'll know Activision very, very well. So I actually got it wrong on the episode, but it's I think I understated it. They're actually a $42 billion with a B market cap. So pretty rare that we're able to get the opportunity to get someone on as high level as Howard Marks that's had the ability to co-found a, a Fortune 500 company uh, and then go back into you know where he's passionate about startups. Yeah, I, th- I think it's super cool that when someone you know makes enough money to be able to just coast, because he didn't have to work again. He didn't have to start another company, but you can tell he's, he's just a passionate guy about building businesses. And I think we're going to learn in this episode that really in this day and age that, that we live in, in the last, you know, five years and, and today, 2019, this is really the time that all of us can have our hands in, you know, in startups and become, you know, hopefully like the next, you know, big, big investor, uh, if we choose. Yeah. And the landscape is changing really quick. And when you guys listen to this episode, listen to Howard's vision. I think a lot of times entrepreneurs, they get stuck up in the weeds of daily operations and they often forget their vision. They forget the enthusiasm of why they started it, why they created it and where it's heading. And it's always valuable to step back, get away from everything and think about that vision and recapture that enthusiasm. And I think you'll, you'll hear this when Howard's discussing how he started Start Engine and where he believes it'll go in the future. Yeah, definitely. And uh, if you guys haven't heard of Start Engine, uh, they are a crowdfunding platform for investing in startups. So uh, everyone's probably familiar with Kickstarter where you you know, you fund uh, a new project, but you're just basically pre-ordering the product. It might come, it might not come. Uh, it might be amazing, it might be terrible, but the most you're going to get is a product, maybe at a discount. With Start Engine, you're actually putting your money, you know, also towards backing this project and this company, but you're actually getting equity in it. So if they do well, you can potentially make money from it. So I think it's really, really exciting, and it's something that never existed, you know, b- before. So with that, let's bring on Howard and stay tuned for our exit commentary after the episode. All right. Here's Howard at Start Engine. Everyone, welcome back. We have a great guest on today, Howard Marks. Howard, welcome to the show. Thanks. Nice to be here. So we actually share the last surname. Uh, I know you're part British, part English, or or part British, part French, and part... What's the third part? American. Well, you're American, British, and French. I'm born in... Right. Born in America, British dad, Romanian mom, grew up in France. Okay. Got it all. Checking a lot of boxes. So where does where does Marx come from, if you don't mind me asking? So I've done a lot of work on Ancestry.com. Mm-hmm. And I've been able to trace the Marx family from Prussia down to the early 1800s and even um, late 1700s. And there were German-speaking, uh, Jewish uh, family living in Prussia, uh, mostly merchants, mm-hmm. and they moved to England, I guess, to escape the pogroms. And one branch moved to the U.S., one branch stayed in the, in, in England. Were you able to and track I'm from it? the English branch. Were you able to track any of the, any of your old uh, ancestors through Ancestry.com? Absolutely. 
it's wow. unbelievable that that system and i did my dna i found i found relatives that i didn't know some second cousins some distant cousins and which it's been unbelievable wow very cool well maybe uh maybe we are related because uh, i think my side comes from england as well so we'll have to i'll have to check it out on ancestry.com see if we find a match sure <laughs> So it's great to have you on the show. We're going to, of course, be talking about equity crowdfunding and Start Engine on this this episode. Uh, I think equity crowdfunding, amazing topic. Uh, I think it's something that knowing and talking to a lot of our listeners, it's something that everyone is now aware of, but a lot of people have not made their first investment, whether they believe it's an access issue or they just don't know that much about investing in early stage startups. So great to have you on to, to talk a little bit more about this. Um, I think a really good, interesting part would be to know a little bit about how you transitioned into equity crowdfunding coming from founding such a, a great company in Activision, now I think a $30 billion market cap. Well, it's been an incredible journey. Uh, the Activision experience has been unbelievable. I mean, so what, what is the chance of co-founding a company that becomes a Fortune 500 uh, company that is thriving, doing really well? It's very rare, as you can imagine. And part of what I wanted to do was invest in young entrepreneurs. And I did that. So as I was investing, there was nothing in Los Angeles that really organized the community of entrepreneurs. So I built an accelerator called Start Engine, which I launched early 2012. And the goal behind it was to find entrepreneurs who needed capital and advice and help in a very I would say accelerated setting so they can launch their business and achieve their dreams. And the mission of Start Engine at that time was to help Los Angeles become a technology city. Well, it started great where we were able to invest in about 20 companies every year. And it was amazing to see all these young founders. They would receive $20,000 from us just to get started. And then we would introduce them to investors. Well, it turns out that we were not the best investors on earth because we ended up investing in women, we invested in minorities, we did all the wrong investment decisions that the venture capitalists don't make, and we made those mistakes. And guess what? When they came out to look for more money, they couldn't find any. That's great. I love the story, Howard. So you built the accelerator in LA to help the city really become a tech city and also help early entrepreneurs find startup capital. And it seems like once they got out of the accelerator, they found themselves in the same position of having trouble attracting that next level of capital to keep them going. Is that is that basically what you found? Yeah, absolutely. So as we invested in these great entrepreneurs, and many of them came from different walks of life, they, some of them, most of them, I'd say pretty much all of them, did not fit the typical mold that the venture capital uh, community is looking for. Um, these are uh, people who graduated from state schools, They have had uh, interesting backgrounds, expertise in different areas. And and yet, uh, with all of that energy and enthusiasm and everything they wanted to offer, they couldn't raise any money. And I pondered on that a lot, trying to understand, was it me the problem? Because I I made the introductions to VCs and to people. Maybe I was not well-connected enough, or maybe those VCs did not have that reaction that if I made an introduction, they have to invest in it. But bottom line was they could not raise money. And I was very very frustrated. Uh, These entrepreneurs became, I would say, uh, uh, disillusioned. They were not seeing how they can continue working with no money, uh, discouraged. These are very bad uh, feelings for an entrepreneur. I mean, you want the opposite. You want them to be encouraged, passionate. And that's who they are. But I'm just saying, given that they couldn't raise money. So for me, my next really big, big work that I wanted to do was solve this. How do I solve access to capital? Now, let's go through the food chain. The banks, well, great. The banks, there are plenty of banks out there, but they don't lend risk money. Um, They will say, hey, look, if you own a house uh, and it has value, equity value, we will lend you against that. Well, great, except that if you lose the money, which is very likely, I mean, you're an entrepreneur and you know one of the companies fails, you lose your home. Um, if you take debt on a personal basis, you could go bankrupt or you'd be paying you know, worse than having student loans. So the question really was, the banks, they're out. Forget the bank. 
there, there it goes. Okay, so what, going down the food chain, who 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 do you have? Do you have well the VCs, the uh, the seed funds? These funds uh, do invest money, but they do about two thousand deals a year all together. That takes all the VCs. You take all of those funds. It's about two thousand deals, and some of the larger companies that you can see when you read the press, they they, they garner a lot of the money, right? So uh, there's a tendency of what we call flight to quality. They they all kind of work in a herd. So if Uber is successful, the next 20 investments is Uber for something else. And then that doesn't work anymore. They find something else. And then you have the angel entrepreneurs. And the angels, they're the best. The angels are the ones who carry the weight most of the time. They're, they maybe do 20,000 deals a year. That's great. That's actually a fantastic number they're great investors because they are very cheerleading supportive they're not looking for control they want to help however however that said uh 20, deals well there's about six hundred thousand new companies a year so it's a small small amount and they can only go so far after they've written their check twenty five thousand fifty thousand uh, sometimes more they they want you to go and find something else, right? They want you to convert their uh, convertible note or whatever, a safe note or whatever you issue to them into a VC round. And again, go back to the VC rounds is only about 2,000 a year. Uh, that's not a given. It happens to many, but not most. So I look at that and I say, wow. Now, I've, oh, I forgot friends and family. You know, that's, even better than the angels. That's the best place ever. But not everybody has access to wealthy parents. Not everybody has access, access to friends. And frankly, they just want to give you the money. They, they want you to be successful. And they are they, they generate the most, I would say, the majority of all investments is friends and family. And that gave me a pause because I said, wow, that's interesting. Friends and family, they're in. But you have to be related, right? They're not going to just go and spray the money to everybody. So my quest was, how do we unlock a larger pool of investors? How do we make that happen? And that was my thinking. And as an entrepreneur, um, I was watching the Kickstarter model very carefully. Uh, and I, I just saw something very valuable there where the crowd came in and they purchased ahead of time on a gadget or they donated money. And the numbers were spectacular. The, the numbers were going up to a billion a year or more. And I thought, wow, that's a great model. But the problem with that is that's not investing. That's giving. That is um, purchasing. That's not investing. And investing, when you invest, you don't get back necessarily a gizmo product. You, know, you get shares. You get stock. Uh, you could get preferred shares. You could get common shares. Anyway, that was, that was my idea. How do I marry the crowdfunding world with the world of finance, the world of investing? Putting them together was really the, the idea I had for the next step for what Starjourney was supposed to do. Now, Howard, when you were thinking about this originally, were you thinking that Start Engine would primarily serve kind of that, that gap of early startups, maybe post accelerator that was trying to access capital? Or did you think that Start Engine could serve much larger, maybe Series B, Series C, uh, or even developed companies through the crowd? Well, at this point, at the beginning, I did not know necessarily who the best company would be for an equity crowdfunding raise. Mm -hmm. And the main reason is because it wasn't done before. Um, I saw that on Kickstarter, if you look at the theme, Kickstarter was mostly gadgets mm -hmm. or uh, companies that have high, big, social, rewarding ideas uh, that people connected with, uh, mm -hmm. journeys that people wanted to be on. So I, I thought, okay, so that's very limiting. You know, that's not, that's not the American industry here. This is just one sliver. So my view was, well, I think equity crowdfunding is going to be bigger than that. It's going to be most companies, hopefully, not every company. And I started to look for customers. So what happened was in April 2012, while I was in the thick of working on the accelerator and investing in companies who subsequently had trouble raising money, as we discussed, some did, by the way, I'm not saying none, 
raise mm-hmm. money, but the vast majority could not raise any money. Out of the 59 deals, probably 40, 45 couldn't raise any money. Okay, that's a big number. Mm-hmm. So something happened. April 2012, the Jobs Act was voted in and signed into law. And it was a bill that promised to change the way small businesses raise money. The idea for them, small business, by the way, the uh, company was under $1 billion in in market cap. So you can imagine uh, there are 5 million companies who fit that bill, by the way. Okay. (laughs) Right. So most, right? But for them, that's a small business, right? I, Mm -hmm. I get it. You know, the statisticians and all these economists working for the government. Okay. So I was like, wow, they're definitely out of touch. But that came out, and that was extraordinary. I read it page to page, cover to cover, and I said, you know what? This is going to be a revolution. Because for the first time in 80 years, the ordinary person can invest. Hmm. I don't know. That sounds pretty interesting. Your neighbor starts Apple, and you get to invest. In the past, your neighbor starts Apple, you can only lend the money. You cannot, they cannot take an investment because they, they're just not allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. So, wow, that was a big idea. And that's how, in many ways, the, the whole thing came, the stars were aligned, basically. Mm-hmm. It all came together. I said, well, let's get started. Except that I had no idea that from the time you sign something in law and until it becomes something you can use, it's a long time. In fact, <laughs> in fact, mm-hmm. the lawyers would tell me, Howard, you're wasting your time. It's never going to work. It's going to take 10 years and they're never going to approve it. Because you know what? The SEC, the last thing they want to do is let ordinary people invest. Forget about it. Then the other set of lawyers said, oh, Howard, even if they do it, no one's going to want to invest online. Mm-hmm. They don't do it that way. It's done by lawyers and private partnerships and this and that and, and, and you know, Wealthy people, no, 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 that's not going to work. And some other people said, oh, Howard, you're going to get sued out of your existence here. Uh, consumers are going to sue you. This is never going to work. And then I took that as a, a very good sign of why I should do this. I love it. I have to I do this. love it, yeah. I have to do it because the general consensus is against it. And typically when you see that as an entrepreneur, that means opportunity. Mm-hmm. Big opportunity. So – Guess what I did? I started it. So I started Start Engine Crowdfunding Inc., the crowdfunding arm of Start Engine. And I said, you know, we need a customer. <laughs> so guess what? It took three years, literally three years from the time it was signed till June 2015 to launch the first customer. Why? Because the laws were not in place. Okay? Three years. That's a long time. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe for the government it's not. But for us, entrepreneurs, that's a huge amount of time so you can imagine my impatience was 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 it was growing Mm -hmm. and i was very frustrated because i saw the need but i couldn't do anything about it so then finally the day comes and we're looking for a customer in around may 2015 and i get introduced to this entrepreneur called paul edio and he's telling me about this new car he wants to build and how exciting it is, and it's a low-cost, high-mileage car. Uh, it's under $10,000. Anyway, great entrepreneur. He just was pounding the table of how exciting, and he's used to people saying, you know, because well, he's raising money for his company, the word no. Basically, no, no, no. Who would ever finance a car company, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. And I say, yes. <laughs> I'm like the guy who says yes. <laughs> A while to, to get through that yes yes and i said look you have tens of thousands of pre-orders of people who love this car why don't you offer them to invest and he's like great he was all in for it that was mm-hmm. his idea that he could go to his community and raise the money well guess what we launched him and we raised 17 million dollars from almost seven thousand people that was the first campaign First campaign, about 45 wow. days. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. It's hard to explain it. And, you know, not every day the first customer you get is a hit, mm-hmm. but it happened. But it was also it was also a demonstration of what this can be. Mm-hmm. So anyway, move forward to May 2016. Virtually a year later, another rule comes out where you can raise up to a million dollars, but very 
efficiently and inexpensively and, you know, no big lawyers and big audits, none of that. You know, very efficient, raise a million, which is, by the way, a lot of money. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs you talk to, you know, like a million, they look at it like if it's, it's like you're offering them a dollar bill. Mm-hmm. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you, for entrepreneurs, for the real ones who are not, they're not the ones who get the big VC $50 million checks. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Because they, they have nothing. So anyway, so we, the, la- the million dollar rule launch and we start seeing companies applying and launching on our platform that are raising a million dollars. And we are just amazed. We're just amazed about the reaction and, and, and the tens of thousands of investors who are f- coming in every month to, to participate. So since then, what happened? We were able to raise over $100 million for companies. We've helped hundreds of companies raise money. We have over 200,000 people who are uh, in our community, and it's growing every day. So we decided we're going to make our life miserable. So here's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to um, what you call a broker dealer, which is a, a, a higher level financial institution. Um, typically, a broker dealer could be what Schwab, E Trade, you know, Goldman Sachs. I mean, you know, these kinds of names. Mm-hmm. Wells Fargo. They're broker dealers. I mean, they have different arms and different things. And so we became a broker dealer in June, and we're registered in 50 states, and we're now launching companies at much higher level of raises. Anyway, and finally, my biggest justification for what we're doing was help the entrepreneurs achieve their dreams, help them raise money, which helps investors participate in journeys that are extraordinary. But also, hopefully, if, they're, if, if the outcome of the company is positive, if that happens, they can make a return on their investment. But typically, I don't know if you know, private equity deals where you invest in a private company, not a public, some of those large public companies, you know, Uber went public. Hmm. Uh, you have to wait a long time to sell your shares. Right. Uh, sometimes seven years. I had one deal where I waited 20 years, but most of the time is around seven, somewhere wow. around there, plus or minus two, right? And I thought that's just not consumer friendly, not not enough friendly. So uh, my next challenge after I we built that beautiful crowdfunding, you know, startengine.com, crowdfunding website, and we're able to raise money for companies, right? And we we have now, I think, over 60 companies on our site, and we're launching over 10 companies a month, and we're growing. I said, we need to help the investors trade their shares. If they want to sell them, good for them. And some who missed out on the raise want to buy some, good for them. We need to do that. Now, great, except again, how do you do this? How, how does a company like Start Engine end up building a stock exchange, right? I mean, yes. not, not the most obvious thing to do a stock exchange for all these private companies. Think about it. Big idea. Anyway, so we uh, announced that we're going to be launching, once all the regulatory things are taken care of, we're going to launch Secondary, which is an alternative trading system. Mm -hmm. It's called Alternative because it's not the NASDAQ and it's not the stock exchange, obviously. So it's an alternative. And we're going to be launching that. And now, this is... This is a big historical moment when it happens. These ordinary investors, Main Street investors, will be able to trade their shares. There's some restrictions. Depending on how the company is issuing the shares, they may have to wait a year or not wait at all. There's different rules, but those are going to be clearly explained to the investors. But think about this. Think about this. It changes everything. Everything has changed. You can raise money for your company, and your investors are going to have some form of liquidity to the extent there are people who want to buy them. It's unbelievable. And we're building that. That was my number one question for you. Is there going to be some type of secondary market in the future to make private shares liquid? Because I know as, as a founder and, and as an early stage investor, as you pointed out, that is one of the biggest obstacles in committing to doing something is just the lack of liquidity. And if that becomes a thing in the future, that excites me personally, from every aspect of startups and private investing. And I know tons of people that would immediately be turning to that platform to look to participate on both sides of it. And I think that would be incredible. What is the, you know, 
what does the legislation look like for that? I mean, let's take one, maybe one example. Let's say you're a startup investor. Is there a certain type of shares that you would have to hold to be able to market those for, for resale, I guess? Well, that was my work that I had to do. So part of the mm-hmm. Jobs Act, you know, I call it the gift that keeps giving, okay? The first mm-hmm. gift was what they call Regulation A+, plus, which is you can raise up to $50 million, but you need an audit and you need to follow with the SEC your offering. And it takes some legwork to get there, but you can raise $50 million and the shares can be traded right away. That's very clear in the in the rule. Those shares are not mm-hmm. registered with the SEC, which is usually what needs to happen. But no, they can be traded. Great. Mm-hmm. Traded where? <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> One knows, right. right? But it was in the it was in the in the documentation. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, they figured it out. The the the, the rule makers. So mm-hmm. then you have the the next gift was a regulation crowdfunding, and you can raise up to one million. Uh, for, but you don't need an audit, and you don't need uh, to file with the SEC. We just give us the information, we process it, and then if everything looks good, we we you can go live, very mm-hmm. quick, it's very extremely quick. And that's the second gift. The third gift that came out was, and no, and by the way, let me finish. You can sell the shares, but you have to hold them for one year. Okay, so mm-hmm. that's the only restriction. Okay, fine, great. So then the next gift came out was that public companies can now access Regulation A+. That's a big idea because public companies, most of them are tiny. I mean, that, everybody thinks of Intel, Apple, and you know Amazon. I, you know, I understand, but most are small, okay? Let's be mm-hmm. very clear. Most public companies are small, and they also need uh, access to capital because they're building their businesses. So how do they raise money? Well, it's complicated on the public market. It costs a lot of money. Guess what? Regulation A plus, A plus solves that entirely, completely solves it. I'm not going to go into too much detail on how they did it before and now how they can use Regulation A plus, but that starts mm-hmm. in January and we're seeing a huge amount of demand. Excellent. So bottom line is, the gift that keeps giving is going to give. And there's one more thing. 20 mm-hmm. years ago, the SEC launched a thing called the alternative trading system. Some people call them dark pools. Why? Because they, they, they trade at night. And oh, anyway, these ATSs, alternative trading system, have been uh, built and developed to trade shares in bulk, called institutional level, and outside of the market arms. But sometimes not. I mean, it's complicated. But anyway, there are about... 50 of them. That's it. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be one of them. And we're going to be the only one that really are catering to these small companies. It's really exciting stuff, Howard. Hey, bosses. I want to tell you about this week's sponsor, Masterworks.io. Masterworks is the pioneer in securitizing blue chip art to make this $1.7 trillion asset class investable by both accredited and non-accredited investors. While the S&P 500 declined by 5.1% last year, the art market returned a whopping 10.6%. And this was called the top performing asset class of 2018 by the Wall Street Journal. Their founder, Scott Lynn, wanted to create a way for everyone to invest in great multi-million dollar paintings. Now anyone can be part of Warhol, Monet, or Picasso. To learn more or to join the exclusive community of blue chip art investors, go to masterworks.io. Make sure you enter Invest Like a Boss in the How You Heard About Masterworks section to skip the waitlist. 2020 is just a year away. We talked about how long it took for the legislation to actually get into a place that it could be acted on and built upon. Do you guys have any projections for next year? Is the industry growing quick enough? What's what's the plans for Start Engine in the year 2020 or some of these new initiatives that you've been working on going to come in uh, in the next year or is it further out? Well, this year we got the broker dealer done. That was in June. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping, I am praying that we can launch our trading platform by the end of the year. But if it happens early next year, then that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And that's the next step. But then we're not done. We're not done until we raise money for 10,000 companies, 10 billion in raises in 10 years. That's our vision. That's a lofty goal. That's aspirational. That is not, uh, I would call, uh, like a, you know, like a 
projection. It has nothing to do with projections. We don't make projections on our business, but it's our vision. It's how we want to be. And imagine how many of them will end up on a trading platform. Oh my God. There are 4,700 public traded companies on the national market system. That's NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange type of markets. And then you have 10,000 plus on the over the counter, you know, small businesses. Anyway, this is not the American industry. The American economy is more than 4,700 companies. I hope it is. I mean, most companies, the vast majority, the 99%, they are private small companies. Mm -hmm. They're the backbone of our economy. They're the biggest job creator for probably about 70% of the jobs. So when we need help for our economy, we go to small business. And what Start Engine is, is we're going to fund small business. And we're going to allow investors to participate early on and have access to liquidity. That is what we're going to do. Do you think that in the future, Howard, that we, t we talked about a few of the different ways that startups get funded from accelerators, friends and family, to angels, VCs. But again, a lot of startups don't have any knowledge or access to a lot of those. They might not have family that's wealthy and they might not know how to access angels or VCs. Do you think that crowdfunding and platforms such as Start Engine become the, the go-to place to find funding in the future, the, the number one place startups will go to look for funding versus other options? Well, Sam, we reviewed all the options at the beginning of this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I went through the food chain, right? Going mm -hmm. up from the banks down to the friends and family, right? There are no other options. That's it. So given that that's it, mm -hmm. it's so obvious to me that equity crowdfunding is the future of finance for small businesses. It is so obvious to me. Now, if you talk to pundits, they'll have all sorts of other uh, predictions and opinions, and that's why they're called pundits. But frankly, I'm an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I have a vision, and I'm going to do everything I can to take it to this vision and make equity crowdfunding not an alternative way of raising money, but the mainstream way of raising money. Future of finance. Here's what we're talking about. Exhilarating. I'm loving this stuff. It's a great story, Howard. I really dig it, but I would be doing a disservice to our listeners if I didn't ask a couple questions for those that would be interested in listing their companies to raise money on Start Engine. So I have just a few questions, just general, give people a quick picture of what they could expect when coming on and bringing their company or applying to list their company with Start Engine. And I think the first one is just, what is the typical size of a raise that you're seeing? Um, you mentioned it, you're launching 10 companies per month. What's a typical size of a raise that they are, or an average size of a raise that they are raising? So it, there are two kinds of regulation here. The first regulation, regulation crowdfunding, that's the one million dollar rule. Mm -hmm. We see we see raises are around average around two hundred fifty thousand. That's for that rule. For the large rule where you regulation A plus, it's in the two to three million mm -hmm. the average. That's incredible. And I saw that actually Start Engine has their own campaign going on right now on Start Engine. So you, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Howard, you can go on Start Engine right now and buy stock in Start Engine through its very own campaign on the platform. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, we, we, we say uh, we eat our own dog food, you know. We, we are raising money also uh, the same way as our investor, our, our entrepreneurs are mm -hmm. because we want to show that instead of us going to grab a check from a VC, which is what typically people do, um, we say no. Um, you can uh, enlist the crowd, make them part of your journey. I call them brand ambassadors. They come in and they love you. If things don't go well in your company, they love you. If things go great, they love you. Well, basically, they, they love you anyway. And they want to <laughs> be part of your journey and they want to help you. They're cheerleaders. When you're down, they cheer you up. When you're up, they cheer themselves. You look, look it's a good thing. It's a great thing. Now, we understand and we make it clear to everybody who invests that it's a high-risk investment. I mean, we're not uh, doing municipal bonds here. <laughs> we're not doing treasuries. We are selling uh, shares in high speculative companies, but high growth potentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, everybody knows the stories of all those uh, famous companies that go on the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. Everybody knows the stories. But 
they don't know necessarily how to get in early, right? Because mm-hmm. they couldn't. Now they can. And Howard, when you're looking at successful campaigns via Start Engine, do you find commonalities? You mentioned the first company that had such a successful raise that they actually went out to all the early buyers of the car uh, and asked and gave them the ability to invest. Do you find that community and this strong network of brand ambassadors is an important element in having a successful raising campaign? I think it's just one element. You know, initially we were very attracted to people who can bring their own community because we had no community. We had nothing, zero, right? But now we're thinking a lot differently because we we defined the perfect entrepreneur for Start Engine. And we had to because we want to make sure that they have a good experience. And the perfect entrepreneur is someone who's willing to put themselves out there. That's the type of entrepreneur we want. They're not, they don't, they don't go to bed at night and wake up in the morning expecting everything to be done. You know, all the money has been raised and I didn't have to do anything. And thank God I'm, 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 I'm lazy. No, 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 no. Wrong person. This person is working hard, right? Mm-hmm. All the time, 24 seven hard, you know, really entrepreneur focused and they can make a campaign a huge success. There's two other elements, a well-defined audience for their company and a compelling offering. We believe that when you line those three things up, there is no limit to this potential. They are able to raise money and they can continue to raise money as they grow their businesses. And that's who we're looking for. Howard, just one more question before we wrap up the episode. I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there. You yourself, a very successful entrepreneur and investor. And I'm sure you get this question a lot, but it's been a crazy year uh, in just startups and business in general. We're looking at the news and there's Jewel on TV that seems to be imploding. There's WeWork on TV that seems to be imploding. We've had some IPO letdowns from Uber to Lyft. And we have all these great companies that are, are now building, uh, and they're looking up to a lot of these companies in the headlines at some point. You know, As an entrepreneur yourself that's built a really successful company in Activision, and you're watching all these startups being built you know, under your eyes through Start Engine, you know, how do you think personally about building a startup? What, what advice would you have for early stage entrepreneurs that are thinking about building a business and potentially a future exit? Well, I have a lot of opinion about that. I mean, uh, really. The main one I would say is this. First of all, the entrepreneur needs a very clear, defined mission that excites them. I, I don't like entrepreneurs who are building a business they're not interested in. That, that, there's a lack of passion. I call it grit. Uh, it's the intersection of passion and resilience. You need that. Quitting gives you 100% chances of failure. So quitting is not a good idea. And many entrepreneurs quit, most quit, right? So we need them to continue and, and not give up. And that's, that's I'm talking to, to you about the foundation, the foundation of an entrepreneur. This is, what I just mentioned, this is the foundation. Now, capital is very important. It's like your oxygen, right? If you run out of oxygen, it's very harsh. Not a good idea. So capital, very good. However, Capital comes in many forms. It could be debt, where you borrow, could be equity, where people invest. And there's also, I would say, dangerous capital where people take control of your company. They get a board seat and and and, and you would say, Well, no, look, Howard, you don't understand what you're talking about, Howard. I, I just sold thirty percent of my company to these investors for twenty million and they have a board seat. What could happen? <laughs> <laughs> what could happen? Are you kidding me? They can fire you out of the company and recap you out of the table. How's that? And all the work you've done and all of that energy and passion, goodbye, got nothing for it. It's the next team that makes all the money. So if you're happy with that, go be my guest. So the capital being the oxygen of the company needs to be structured correctly. And I'll tell you this, what Start Engine is offering is ability for these entrepreneurs to issue capital without the strings attached. And those mm-hmm. strings are like ropes. I mean, they're awful. And I, I, you, you probably hear that a lot from entrepreneurs you interview about when something goes wrong with your, with your investors, what happens? Not pleasant, not fun. So mm-hmm. in a way, Start Engine solved two things, access to capital and the ability for the entrepreneurs to stay in control. 
How about that? I think you're doing great work in the industry, Howard. Giving startups access to capital really is enabling people to build their dreams. And there's not ever been a time in history that this is this has been possible. Uh, much in part to Start Engine and other companies and leaders like you that are paving the way for this to happen. So everyone out there, get out there, build your dreams. Start Engine can help make it happen. Howard, it's been amazing having you on the show. We appreciate you spending some of your time today and and uh, giving us a shout on Invest Like a Boss, showing us the vision for crowdfunding and what Start Engine will become in the future. Thank you. Really happy to be on your show. Sam, you ready to get your engine started? <laughs> I would never know what line you're going to come into this exit commentary with. That was a good, good one. And yes, I'm ready. And I'm also excited for what the future of this this is all going to be. Because I think a lot of people are going to have access to startups that never felt they should have. And there's going to be a lot of startups that have access to capital that they never felt they could acquire. Yeah, definitely. I think it's so cool. He used a kind of analogy where like, where else were you going to get the money? And I thought about this, you know, was like you, you hear the story about how Google started uh, in a garage or how Facebook started. And at some point, they all needed money, but they had potential. And the only thing they could really do, you know, you can't really go to a bank. There's no collateral. Uh, you can ask your parents to mortgage their house and you might lose it. But also the most they're probably going to get back <laughs> is just the money that they lent you. You know, if you if you lend friends and family money, you know, just use your terrible idea. You're usually not really buying into the, the business. You're... You're just you know, lending the money, hope, you know, maybe with interest, maybe without. And I guess in some rare cases, you could become a partner. But in general, like if you just mm-hmm. wanted to, you know, say, you know, here's fifteen grand or here's fifty grand, you know, pay me, you know, I'll, you know, if if it, if your company does well, you know, I would like a, a bigger return. And if it doesn't, you know, hopefully I can get the money back. You know, maybe not. That never really existed, you know, until really now. Yeah, and. Johnny, I remember at the summit, there's a lot of questions about how to raise capital for companies that are not necessarily fitting into the VC profile, right? I mean, there's a lot of companies out there that are not trying to become a $5 billion company. There's a lot of founders out there that are trying to build something from scratch into a $15 million company. And there's not a lot of capital out there that necessarily can go to funding those companies. Some people are saying, oh, you can go get a loan. But Small business loans are like really hard to get, <laughs> you know, like so. And, and then to your point, a lot of people don't have friends and family that can support a startup or that's just not a good idea in most cases. So I think if, if this becomes a thing, which it clearly looks like it is now, Start Engine has raised more than one hundred million dollars for 270 companies. That's really impressive traction. If that continues 10 years from now, it's going to be a hell of a great time to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, definitely. And I think this is really cool for both sides. I mean, in kind of the beginning of the episode, you know, it sounded more like it's just for investors, but really it's for the entrepreneurs as well. Because especially with our listeners, you know, I would, I would say probably at least half of our listeners are entrepreneurs or are starting, mm-hmm. you know, some kind of business on the side. You know, one thing I really liked about what Howard was talking about was how everyone said, don't do this, don't do this. And he's like, well, that's probably a good sign that we should do it. And we, we hear this narrative quite often in these podcasts, but this in this one in, in particular case was about entrepreneurship. And it got me thinking, Johnny, I don't know if you ever heard the story of how Airbnb was founded and Uber, but they were all getting pushback from investors and tons and tons of no's from venture capitalists because everyone said, this is a, just a massive liability. You're going to have people come in your homes through the platform and get murdered and you're going to get sued. People are going to get in car accidents and Uber and you're going to get sued. And everyone was saying, coming up with these thousand reasons why you shouldn't do it. And because of those thousand reasons, a lot of people didn't do it, but these guys did it. And now they've built multi-billion dollar companies. And this is very similar to what, to what Howard was saying about starting Start Engine. I definitely agree. But I also think that when everybody gives you, you know, pretty legitimate reasons why you shouldn't start something, if you're going to kind of half-ass it, you know, you're just going to kind of dabble into it. You definitely shouldn't be doing it because they're warning you how difficult it's going to be. But at the same time, if you're willing to go and do whatever it takes, because, you know, both Airbnb and, and Uber, you know, have li- like literally been fighting like bureaucracy, uh, like, you know, taxi mafias, you know, like mm-hmm. the hotel, like the hotels change, like the, the, the government, they've been fighting everyone since they started. And they became successful because they had had a good product that's needed. Uh, and, I, and I think Start Engine is kind of the same thing, where 
you know, if Howard, you know, was, you know, some bootstrapper and he's like, all right, I'm just going to work on this on the side and, you know, hopefully it pays, you know, it pays itself off mm-hmm. in a couple of years. It never would have worked. But the fact that he had the money, he had the backing, he had the passion and he said, you know what, I'm going to do whatever it takes, even though it's going to be hard. That's, that's why it's a success today. You know, same with Airbnb and same with Uber. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, if you're going to get a lot of pushback about reasons you shouldn't do it, you should probably check your gut and make sure that you have some grit in there that you can get through all the downs uh, and ups, but ups and downs that you're going to go through and getting this off the ground and gaining traction. And if you do, the opportunity is probably that much greater. Yeah, I definitely, definitely agree. So I'm curious, like, would you see yourself more on the investor side or on the kind of entrepreneur side if you were to use start engine Ooh, that's interesting because i'm i'm right now basically 50 percent investor 50 percent entrepreneur operator I, there's some great campaigns right now on start engine we had on ruben slava from india gogo back in the day maybe a year and a half ago talking about crowdfunding we also had on republic.co that was doing similar back then it seemed like all the campaigns were kind of companies that really were having trouble finding any type of funding or getting a lot of no's, sort of unattractive products, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. Now I'm looking and there's there's really good companies uh, listed on Start Engine. In fact, I have a friend here in Charlotte that started a mattress reseller company, online company, from with 50 grand, and he's built it into 40, 40 million a year in sales and never knew how to to raise capital, didn't know how to go find angels, didn't know how to attract venture capital. So he's literally done it bootstrap the entire time. And lo and behold, I was having wine with him the other night in Charlotte and he was talking about listing his company on Start Engine to raise funds uh, because that, that's what that's the only route he knew. And that's a great business. So I mean, there's, there's really good companies listening now. I think it's very intriguing uh, as an investor and as a startup, there's just more and more companies going this route now. It's becoming much more common. So I don't know, Johnny, I haven't invested in any companies through a crowdfunding platform to date, but I'm definitely going to start getting on the email feeds and, and looking at the, the offerings and campaigns. Mm. How about you? Because I know that you have actually participated on one side of this market. And which one was that, Johnny? Oh, you know, I, I can't even remember the name of it. It was a, I think I it remember was the Republic. name of it. Yeah. What was it? It was oh, Beat Stars. I, I, Okay, Beats. Sorry. I kept I'm thinking Beats. I'm like, it wasn't definitely wasn't Beats by Dre. <laughs> like there were, but that was I haven't awesome. heard I haven't heard anything from them since. And and to be fair, you know, it wasn't a lot of money. I think I put it in like 500 bucks the minimum just to just to kind of test it out. And I haven't logged in, so I haven't really seen like what has happened. But I would kind of assume that nothing's happened. It's kind of it's kind of just sat there. So yeah, it's weird because I mean, I I know more about your investments than you do, John. And look how passive you are. And look how hands on I am. So I actually looked them up a couple of weeks ago, just out of curiosity. It looks like they're doing very well. Uh, okay. Their their website says they're the world's number one marketplace to buy and sell beats. Really slick website. Looks like their apps rolling. But it's really weird that they didn't send out any type of communication. And I think that is also part of the struggle in, in the market right now. When you invest through these, you don't really, you don't get to know the founders uh, and there's no standard set of communication or any type of protocols for this stuff. So in this case, you invested, I think like a year ago and you haven't gotten any update since. To me, that's out of line. I think for anything that's early stage, you should be getting monthly or at a minimal quarterly updates in good and bad times. I mean, that's, you got to know what's going on in the company. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, and to be fair, I haven't logged in, so I don't know. And actually, for whatever reason, their website says we try later right now. So that's kind of strange. But <laughs> I'm, I'm a very passive investor. So I think, you know, as you said, like, I don't log in. I never look at, you know, what the S&P is doing. I never look at what my funds are doing, you know, except for when I have to either once a month or once a quarter when we're doing the updates. And that's why I know it's like, you know, startup investing, not, you know, it's, it's not for me because I think the reason why you like it is because you can be involved because you can feel, you know, ownership and you, especially if you have a voice, you know, you know, the owners or, you know, you're attending the meetings and you can kind of mm-hmm. help steer it the right way. Like for me, that's the exact opposite of what I want. You know, I, I want to put my money somewhere, not think about it and then just be, log in whenever I feel like it and, and see it grow. Yeah. I, I, I see your side of it. I think that's why there's 
everyone's portfolio out there is different. It's all tailored to their lifestyle, what they're trying to achieve. I like investing in startups that give me some type of lifestyle perk. So, mm-hmm. for instance, the microbrewery company Black Hops down in Australia, I can visit a couple times a year. I can go to Singapore and visit the guy Glintz and spend a few days there in some of my favorite hotels and and hang out with them. Uh, and and you know, Barcelona, I'm invested in a startup, so there's a reason to go there for quote unquote business. But I definitely understand your position and the passive approach and how it suits your lifestyle. And and honestly, Johnny, a lot of times I look at what you're doing, I get pretty envious. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> well, there's uh, different things that just get us going in the morning, right? I think if you didn't have these things, you know, you, you maybe you would be bored out of your mind. And while for me, by having those things, it would just stress me out. So, you know, we all kind of yeah. run away from, you know, it just, it's normal humans to avoid the pains and go towards, you know, our pleasures. That's right. Case in point, you're in Playa del Carmen right now and you're loving it. When I was there, I loved it for all the same reasons that you loved it, but I was so stressed every single day because I couldn't find adequate workspace. The internet was choppy. Mosquitoes were in the co-working space. I could never get into a groove. And if I can't get into a groove work-wise, I become miserable. And even the nicest place in the world turns into unpleasurable place. So for those reasons, because you're not as active in some of the projects and especially startup stuff, you can enjoy a place like Playa del Carmen a lot more than I can. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I've literally been just you know taking my time. I think kind of living that, you know, that Mexican lifestyle where I wake up when I want, you know, you know, go for a walk to the gym, you know, kind of take my time working out, go home, you know, hang out for a bit, <laughs> maybe have some breakfast, and then you know when I feel like going to work, I go to work. When I when I feel like leaving, I'm like, all right, that, that's enough. Where someone's like, hey, we're having a barbecue, having some beers, you know, it's it's kind of just an easy life. However, I also think yeah. that in in the last year, things have changed a lot here. They've built more co working spaces. I think there's a total of four now that are actually all very good, or at least three of them are very, very good, you know, and there's like the new Selena one is completely indoors. So there's, I, like, I haven't seen a single mosquito in there ever. Uh, amazing. Well, good for them. I know they're trying to improve the area a lot. Hey, maybe some of the startups, uh, just like Bali is becoming such a, such a destination for startups, maybe Cancun and the Yucatan Peninsula will become a destination for the Americas. Time will tell. But if you guys want to check out Start Engine, they actually have a company that has raised money through them that's now going public is called Highly. I, I think I'm pronouncing it correct. H-Y-L-E-T-E. It's an apparel company. And if they have a successful IPO, that might be a game changer for crowdfunding uh, for equity. If they can show demonstrate that hey, here's a company that raised money through our platform, went all the way through to IPO and made a lot of money for the investors. I think that's going to bring a lot more attention uh, and drive a lot more demand for this type of stuff. Yeah, I definitely agreed. I, I think it's, you know, a lot of these are kind of still early. So people were like, all right, sounds like a cool concept, but not really sure, mm-hmm. you know, how, how it's going to turn out. But I do think that this is, this is the future. I mean, like, it's such a, like, how much of someone's time as a startup founder is going towards fundraising? Oh, it can, it, it can break your back at, at any level. I mean, it's not even pre seed or seed rounds. You can series A, B, C. It's a full time job and it often can destroy a company just through the, the rounds when you're planning it for it to be a month long process and it becomes a six month process or a year and you can't spend your time in operations. It's really, really damaging to a company, especially at an early stage. So if this can bring the excess of capital in a more efficient way, it's going to be, it's going to be good for startups. Yeah, a million times. I mean, it just sounds ridiculous that, you know, like these startup founders are not spending their time working on their product where they want to be. And most, like, I, I guess, you know, you have the technical guy and then you have the, the, you know, the charisma guy, but like they, they shouldn't be spending even half their time trying to raise money. Like that should just mm-hmm. be something kind of on the back end, like through, through Start Engine. So, uh, I love that they're here and I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, what's going to happen with them. Absolutely. 277 reviews now. Uh, t- yeah, That's 200, just in yeah. Uh, US, US iTunes. That's just, oh my God, this is crazy. So big thanks, everyone. That, that's really, really cool. Also, big thanks to this week's sponsor, masterworks.io. We told you about them in the mid-row, but you can check them out at masterworks.io and see what uh, investments they have to offer right now. All right, guys. Thanks for your participation. Thanks for your reviews. 
and looking forward to catching up with you guys next week. Let's make it a great Q4 together. Adios, amigos. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.